G'day everyone, Matt Elder Family Bricks here. What is Hampton Court Palace Castle UK like now? It has reopened with COVID-19 measures in place. Is it worth going? What has changed? What is the experience like? Etc. We'll cover this in the video and give our thoughts and first-hand experience as a family. We do a full tour of Hampton Court Palace Castle grounds and gardens in about 10 minutes. This video is brought to you by McCatsum Holiday Homes in Margate and Broadstairs. Great for a week's holiday or a weekend escape, being just over an hour east of London, UK. Treat yourself to amazing sunsets, a Lego wall or great food. Visit www.macatsim.com and mention this YouTube video and we'll look after you. We spent the day at Hampton Court Palace Castle UK August 3rd, 2020, four weeks after it reopened, so it had some time to bed in the new coronavirus safety guidelines and will give you a sense of if Hampton Court Palace Castle is worth visiting. On the screen you can see the names of different attractions pop up as we go past them. We arrived at 10am when the kids playground, called the Magic Garden, opened. From the car park if you hang a left you can get in the side entrance so you don't have to go all the way through the palace grounds to get to it. First thing in the morning other people had had the same idea so they give you wristbands and a 90 minute time slot. After our session was done we came back later in the day and could get straight in. It wasn't super busy and might be the best kept secret. The playground itself is really well done and naturally kids love it and happily spend hours here. It does have water springing up down low so it might be worthwhile bringing a towel and a change of clothes for the kids if the day is warm. Compared to peak season last year, this has a fraction of the number of people with it. It's really pleasant and easy to get tables and chairs. The vast majority of it was open although the shop was closed and the drinking water fountains turned off. So you're going to need to bring your own food and drink if you get hungry. So after our 90 minutes we ended up leaving. With hindsight we probably could have stayed if we wanted to as no one was chasing you out. Notice in general throughout the video how few people there are wandering around. The palace and grounds are considerable, but again, compared with last year's peak season, nowhere near the numbers of people are walking around. As with most places at the moment, you have to pre-book tickets, and we didn't have any problems with that. We'd previously gotten an annual pass that also includes the Tower of London, Kensington Palace, Hillsborough Castle and Gardens. So if you go to two attractions, it's cheaper than paying individually and really good value. Here is the main pathway leading up to the West Gate entrance. The main entrance, slightly to the left, is closed, as in general they have a one-way loop throughout Hampton Court, Palace, Castle and Grounds. With your pre-booked tickets, it's straight through. Leeds Castle could take some pointers from this. There's hardly anyone here. It's a nice day during school summer holidays. It's really surprising. So we head on into Henry VIII's apartments. Hampton Court Palace Castle is huge and sprawling. In a sec we'll go into the Royal Chapel, which still functions, so there's no filming for it or King Henry VIII's crown, which is also here on display. These rooms all look out onto Fountain Court, named so for obvious reasons. Later in the video we'll be in the courtyard. We are now in the Georgian story part of the palace which dates from 1714 to 1737. This is the public dining room. So all this area relates to George II and Queen Caroline when they lived here 300 years ago. This overlooks the Great Fountain Garden. Any ideas as to why it was named that? Next into the state bed and the Queen's Gallery. Architect William Kent was employed at the time to design new furnishings and decor including this Queen's Staircase in 1733. And here is Fountain Court from the lower level. The architectural detailing is really quite impressive. The Fountain Court was designed by Sir Christopher Wren, the same guy who did St Paul's Cathedral in the heart of London. From here we head over to the area called William III's Apartments. We take the Queen's staircase up to the first floor and head into the communication gallery. These were for the time period of 1689 to 1702. And down the King's staircase, which obviously has to be grander than the Queen's version, with every surface imaginable painted. From here out to the clock court. On the upper left is the clock, which as a numpty I made sure I filmed it so that you couldn't see it properly. This astronomical clock was installed in 1540 and was designed by Nicholas Kratzer. This is a pre-Copernican and pre-Galilean astronomical clock that is still functioning today. Next we head on back to Base Court which is where you come in when you first come through the West Gate. Base Court contains elements of Woosley's original palace and Henry VIII's embellishments alongside some further Baroque additions by Sir Christopher Wren. Base Court contained 44 lodgings reserved for guests while the second court, Clock Court today, contained the very best rooms. 
Next we went on through the gift shop into King Henry VIII's kitchens. It's really awkward now to find. Usually you'd enter these from the main entrance, but with that closed now, they are very easy to miss. Back into the center of clock court, where you can see the colonnade, those white columns. And continuing numptiness, I managed to go under the astronomical clock that we spoke about a little bit earlier. Hampton Court Palace Weddings. As you'd expect, Hampton Court Palace does weddings. This can be done in the garden room and takes about 180 guests. There is also the little banqueting house, which is smaller and takes up to 50 guests. Naturally, Hampton Court Palace allows the use of various staircases and the grounds for the backdrop to wedding photos, etc. Now we're heading through the Fountain Court to the east front and gardens. We'll head up one of the tracks towards the North Canal, pass down to the Long Water, along the South Canal, back to the east front entrance. There are numerous birds near the North Canal, and on the other side, you can see all the fences to the palace. This looks up to what is called the Long Water. Spinning around, we see the Great Fountain, and further beyond that, down to the east front entrance way and get a sense of just how big this area is, with very few people here. Where is Hampton Court Palace located? Hampton Court Palace is located 12 miles southwest of central London and upstream of central London on the Thames River. When was Hampton Court Palace built? Building work started in 1515 for Cardinal Thomas Woosley, a favourite of King Henry VIII. In 1529, the cardinal fell out of favour from the king, so he gave the palace to Henry VIII to check his disgrace. Henry VIII enlarged Hampton Court Palace to accommodate his sizeable retune of court tiers. Who currently owns Hampton Court Palace? The palace is currently owned by Queen Elizabeth II and the Crown. King William III had a massive building and expansion program so that the palace could rival that of the Palace of Versailles. Work finished in 1694 with two main building styles showing, that of Tudor and Baroque. We now head into the privy or private garden. This has existed on the south side of Hampton Court Palace since the reign of Henry VIII. Further down are elaborate fence and gate decoration that leads straight onto the River Thames. One can imagine that back in the day it was used for travelling to and from central London. The Privy Garden today is a restoration of William III's Baroque Privy Garden of 1702. The gardeners have restored the grounds using the original plant varieties and the hornbeam blower and statues were all part of the king's original designs. This is now the pond gardens where originally fish ponds were made for King Henry VIII. In the 1690s, Mary II transformed the Tudor ponds into sunken gardens to display her rare and exotic plant collection. In the early 20th century, gardeners created the Dutch style garden that we see today with its tiered paths, topiary hedges, statues and bedding. The Privy Garden at Hampton Court is one of the most accurately reconstructed gardens because so much was recorded about the original in 1702. William III died before the garden was completely finished, which meant all the gardeners and workmen were frightened of not getting paid. They therefore submitted the fullest possible account of their work. William III and Mary II created the Great Fountain Garden on the East Front. It contained 13 fountains and planted two radiating avenues of yew trees in the fashionable form of a goose foot. Heading into the wilderness area, originally it was a Tudor orchard filled with pear, apple and cherry trees. In the 1950s, many of the elm trees succumbed to Dutch elm disease and were removed. Now heading out to the car park which is charged at £1.60 an hour. Really do hate these rip off car parks. Creates a bottleneck for people leaving. Just include it in the price of admission and make everyone's life simple. Never understand why attractions want people's last memory to be a frustrating parking meter experience. The parking meter wouldn't print the receipt, so if ever get a ticket in the future, going to be a nightmare to deal with. So is Hampton Court Palace still worth a day out? Absolutely. Think at this point in time it could be the best kept secret. Most of it's open, although the small art gallery with some serious old masters is closed. They really need to sort that out, as it's such a shame. The maze is also closed. Obviously I'm not a fan of the car park stupidity when it comes to the extortion hourly rate. Very few people were also wearing face masks on the day. We went on a day where they had 50% off eating out in August, but the cafe staff still had little clue how to implement this, so hopefully this gets better. I was talking with the staff and they said ever since they'd reopened it had been like this with low visitor numbers. Weekends are the same with low numbers, and you could tell they were concerned. Like many places, take advantage of this while you can. This isn't sustainable. Either attractions like this are going to have to seriously close or prices are going to have to increase dramatically as the running costs either way are huge. Would you go? 
If you've been, what did you think? Sound off in the comments below. What are other castles like post lockdown? How do they compare? Recently we've done similar videos on Leeds Castle, Hever Castle and Legoland Windsor UK as to what they are like post lockdown. Or you can check out our sponsors accommodation on the Kent coast, just a bit over an hour east of London for a great weekend, getaway or holiday. That's it from us here at Family Bricks. Hit that thumbs up if you found something useful in this video and thanks for watching. Until next time when we talk about all things lifestyle.